When Jesus selected his disciples, he said to them that he was going to make them into something that they weren't yet. He used a very interesting phrase. He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And they probably had no idea what that meant at the time. It's just like I had no idea what that meant when I became a Christian. I mean, I pretty much became a Christian so that I wouldn't go to hell, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not a bad reason, but it's a little self-serving. And maybe that's why you became a Christian as well. And yet Jesus says to us, he says, you know, you're, you're saved. You become a Christian not just to have your sins forgiven and not just to go to heaven and avoid hell, not just to be a better person, but to fish, to try to reach people for Jesus, to let them know about the love and the forgiveness of Jesus, to fish for men, women, and children. That's what this phrase means. And that's our title today, Sent to Fish. Now, perhaps this is the point where some of you go, wait a second, that's not really what I signed on for. I don't really want to fish for people. I like the fact that I know Jesus. I like that I know that I'm going to heaven and that he's helping me live a better life. But why do I have to fish? Why bother people with what I believe? I mean, after all, most religions don't bother people. Some do, but most don't. Most Christian churches don't really try to convert people to Jesus. They're just very content with what they're doing and you know who they are. Certainly, many Christians don't go around sharing Jesus with others. So why not just keep our mouth shut? Like, what's the big deal? Well, let's talk about that today. The big idea, why fish? And the way that, uh, that we're going to answer that question today is found here in Acts 3 and 4 in two of the very first fishermen for Jesus, Peter and John. And they were literally fishermen, as many of you know. They had a small business there on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus recruited them to leave that and become fishers for him to, to save people's souls. And so let's pick up the story. It's a long section, about 60 verses today. And so I'm going to give an overview of the story, and then we're going to dive back in and hit specific verses as we address the big idea. So here in Acts 3, Jesus has risen from the dead and ascended. The Holy Spirit has come. The church has began in, ch in chapter 2. We see a picture of what the church looked like at the end of chapter 2. It's pretty awesome. And then in 3, verse 1, Peter and John come into the temple to pray. And on their way in, through the most popular gate, the gate called Beautiful, they see a crippled man who was put there every day to beg. And, and it says that he was, he was crippled from birth. And as he's laying there, he shouts to Peter and John, do you have any money? And Peter and John say, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, walk. And this guy goes to stand up, and they help him up. And as, as, as he's lifted up, it says his legs are strengthened. And he's like walking, and he's starting to run and dance. Like he's the first MC Hammer. And you can't touch this. And he's like dancing all throughout the temple courts. He's in the court of the Gentiles. He's in the court of the Jews. And he's running around. He's making quite a stir. And so the people see this guy. They couldn't miss him. They'd seen him laying there for years. And they're like, what happened? How did this happen? And, and he points to Peter and John. They did it. And so that creates a captive audience where Peter then starts to, to, to preach spontaneously. And he says to the people, he says, we didn't heal him, Jesus did. You know, the Jesus you killed a few weeks ago. But God raised him from the dead and you acted in ignorance. But the good news is, if you repent, your sins will be wiped out and the times of refreshing will come from the Lord. Verse 19 and, and so while he's preaching this message, the leaders come running in, the leaders of the temple, because they sense this commotion, and they're not happy at all. They see the Peter and John, and they're like, oh, those are the guys that were with that dead carpenter that we just took out, Jesus. And they're not happy because they're preaching the gospel. And, and they're especially not happy because it's in the temple. And they're really not happy because at the end of the message, a couple thousand more say yes to Jesus. So they are just fit to be tied and very upset, and so they have... 
um, Peter and John arrested and thrown in jail for the night. And the next morning, they convene a meeting. And at that meeting, they call in Peter and John. And at this meeting, I cannot express to you the authority and the power that's in the room. There's the high priest, the assistant high priest, the former high priest, the Sanhedrin, the, the, um, the elders, the teachers, all of the religious and political leaders of Jerusalem are in this meeting to talk to Peter and John about what they have done. And they ask them, how did you do this? We pick up the story in verse 8. Peter says, and don't miss this, filled with the Holy Spirit. Guys, don't read over that. That continues to be the thing that, that should concern us the most, that, that we don't leave home without it. Holy Spirit, please fill me up today. Holy Spirit, I need you. May I depend on you. May I love you most. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, may I be addicted to you. Because when that happens, everything else kind of falls into place. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's being filled up by the Holy Spirit. And he says, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed... So that's kind of a stab there. Peter's like, are you kidding me? Like, we're, we're in trouble because we healed a guy? You know, that's lame, actually. And, and then he says, know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. He probably pointed at him. And they knew exactly what he was talking about because they you know, trumped up charges, false witnesses, and they, 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 they put Jesus to death, whom you crucified, but who God raised from the dead. And then he says, the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, and, and you, need, you need to know like what a low blow that was because this would have been a famous verse quoted from Psalm 118 about the Messiah. And the idea was that there would be people that would reject the Messiah and discard him like a builder that doesn't want to use a particular stone. But then God takes that stone and puts it in as the cornerstone. And so the stone, the Messiah that you guys rejected, Jesus took that, or God took that, and raised him up to be the cornerstone for the whole thing. Congratulations, you guys are famous. You're in the Bible. You rejected and killed Jesus. So they had to love that. And then verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So they send out Peter and John, and they have this little meeting, like, what are we going to do with these guys? And they're just so frustrated by the whole, with the whole thing, but they decide, check it out, verse 18, they decide they're going to let them off. They call, I mean, what else can they do? They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So like, we're going to let you off with a warning. But from now on, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about this Jesus guy. We don't care whatever else you want to do, but don't talk about Jesus. Which, by the way, isn't that basically the message of our culture? Like, you can believe whatever you want, whatever you want to do in your homes, whatever you want to do in your little church buildings. We don't care. All right, you can teach your kids however you want, but when you get out there in public, don't really talk about Jesus. Like, we're not into that. Quit talking about him. Keep him to yourself. And there might even be some of you that believe that here today. But check out Peter's response. They both replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, you can warn us, you can threaten us, but we're not going to shut up. You got to do what you got to do, but we're going to keep talking about Jesus. And here's the interesting thing about this exchange. The men there in the room that Peter and John are talking to, very religious group. Like these men believe in the same God that Peter and John do. They have the same Bible. They have the same Old Testament heroes. It's almost completely the same, except for this one irritating difference. Peter and John want to add Jesus to the mix. And they're like, no, no, we're not, that's not happening. 
okay? Just like we hear it today in our culture. Believe in God, it's all good, but no, no, we don't want to hear about that Jesus. And, and so here's what Peter says, and, and this is really, again, it answers the question, why fish? He says, number one, we can't help it. We can't help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is not like our doctrine is better than your doctrine. Getting together in a back room, we need to write a New Testament to add to the old. That's not what this was about. This is about something they had seen. They had lived with Jesus. They had, they had seen him die. They had seen him after he rose from the dead. They hung out with him for 40 days. They ate with him. Over 500 people saw him. We talked about that last week. And so they're like, how can you expect us to be quiet? But he's everything to us. We're going to keep fishing for people. We have to because of what we saw. Now, this is why this is so important for us. Because if you're like me, it can get it can get a little intimidating sometimes sharing with people because maybe you're thinking, well, I don't know if I'm going to have all the right answers to their questions. We have these fears and hang-ups. I get that. We all, we all, I'm sure, struggle with that. What if they have an argument that you know, I haven't heard of before? What if they say something I can't refute? Like we have this attitude that maybe we, you know, we need to be like a lot better in theology or comparative religions so we don't share. We get afraid. What this is saying to us, and I've told you this before, we make it way too complicated. We get all spun out by some of this stuff, and it's way, way simpler than that. You guys ready for this? Something happened in history. Something happened in history. A guy lived, not just any guy, the Son of God, was killed for our sin, put in the ground, and raised from the dead. That's factual. And this is so huge that it becomes the centerpiece of all human history. And we're not going to be able to answer every question that people want to throw out. I've told you this before that so often we get into these tangents and we get out into the weeds. People ask questions maybe about sexuality or the age of the earth or what about this, what about... Guys, keep it on the person and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and his love for you. You're like, we talked about this last week. Yeah, we'll probably talk it about again next week and the week after because this is, this is what it's all built on. The person of Jesus Christ, that he, that he died for our sins so that our sins will be wiped away and that he raised so that we can live a resurrection life. And not just something happened in history, something happened in me. See, now this becomes not just factual, becomes personal. I'm saying we can, and I'm not saying in an arrogant way, but I'm saying like in a bold way, we should be able to say something happened in me. And a perfect example of this is the crippled man healed in chapter 3. He can't help himself. He's this spectacle dancing around the temple. And I was thinking how in such a greater way We've been touched by Jesus and healed. Crippled in our sin, spiritually lame from birth. I'm telling you, we could never pull ourselves up to walk ourselves. Jesus had to pull us up. Our state was pitiful and hopeless. Just like picture that man in a situation. And I mean, and all disabilities are tragic, but picture it in that culture. And that guy's case was destitute. I mean, to be disabled like that in that culture with like no safety nets at all. And, and yet here you have his joy. Imagine his joy when he's healed, dancing around like he, like he was. And so in a much greater way, our joy from being lifted up by Jesus, because our spiritual state was hopeless and our shriveled up soul because of sin. Like, guys, do we realize that our sin 
is so much worse than we could ever imagine. Like however bad we think our sin is, it's way worse than that. But good news, God's love, however great you think it is, it's way greater than that. And his love forgives us of our sin if we call upon him. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, I'll speak for myself, but maybe you can relate. I just need to be a lot more thankful and appreciative that in a much deeper, more sorry condition than even not being able to walk is that Jesus has saved my crippled soul. Is it true of me? Is it true of you? I can't help myself. I'm gonna talk about the Lord. This is the best news ever. Is that my story? Is that your story? I uh, read in my devotions this week in Mark chapter one, a story just so amazing of a leper that Jesus healed. And Jesus says to the guy after he heals him, don't tell anybody. Remember that story? And which is strange why he says that, but, but we think it's because that Jesus didn't want people to be all focused on his miracles and miss his message. Jesus is more about his message than his miracles. So he says, don't, don't tell anybody. What does the guy do? He disobeys Jesus and goes and tells everybody. And I love that. I don't know whether to be upset at him for disobeying or give him a high five. Because he can't help himself. He said, I got I to gotta talk. I, I got to talk about what Jesus has done. Right? Jesus tells him, don't do it. You can't fish yet. And the guy says, I'm going to do it. I can't help myself. What does Jesus tell us? Is Mark, I want you to fish. And so often I keep my mouth shut. It's backwards. Man, he had to. He couldn't help it. And I was thinking, you know, the times I, I kind of clam up and maybe get quiet, like especially out in my relationships in the community. And I'm thinking, again, I'll speak for myself, but maybe you could relate. There can only really be one explanation for that. It's not that good a news. Right? Like, like if you ever, have you ever had like this really good news that you wanted to share with people, but you couldn't yet? I mean, it happens to me all the time because I get in confidential kind of situations, can't share something yet, right? Because, you know, maybe someone else wants to tell them or, or it's just confidential for a period of time. And that just, that just like kills you. You want to share with people. You want to let them know this good news, but you can't yet. And yet here with Jesus, we have the best news ever. And he says, like, go for it, share it. And we're like, eh, I don't know. And I, I'm thinking, like, what, what could that possibly be about? Well, maybe, maybe we're just not completely gripped by what great of news that it really, really is. And I love these guys because they go back to their Christian friends there after this story when they're released. And, and they, they shared with them all that had happened and all the positive praise reports. And, and, and then it says they prayed. And it says, I love what they prayed for. They prayed for more boldness. It's like as if they weren't bold enough. You know, Peter's standing in front of all the heavy hitters of the city saying, you killed him, right? They pray for more boldness. Like I think about some of our prayers. Like how do we typically pray? Keep us safe, right? <laughs> right? Traveling mercies. <laughs> it's like we, we, get, we, we get this inward kind of keep us safe kind of prayer. I'm not saying those are bad prayers. But like these guys are praying, we need more boldness so we can keep the pedal to the metal in sharing Jesus with people. So we can't, we, we can't help it. Is that our story? It's not a guilt trip. This is not like, oh, you know, have you said anything lately? It should be, can't help, it's the best news ever. Why would I hold back? The second reason to fish is because you can't deny it. And I don't mean this in like kind of condescending, arrogant way, but just in a matter of fact way, I'm putting myself in the sandals of these religious leaders as this is going down. 
and they're just so frustrated because they can't deny what's happening. All around them, 4-4, four, four, many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So that's a church of 10,000 plus now with women and children, and they're all hanging out there in the temple courts. And it's like, so they can't deny what they see, and they see Christians loving each other, and they're, they're meeting each other's needs financially. And, and there's joy, and there's all this stuff happening that dead religion could never do. And they can't deny it. And verse 7 says, by what power or what name did you do this? Why? They can't deny that something miraculous has taken place. Verse 16, what are we going to do with these men? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have performed an outstanding miracle. And we cannot deny it. I love this verse, 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. That's just the best right there. These guys are so frustrated, and they're seeing this healed guy, and he's grinning like a kid on Christmas standing there right next to these, you know, Peter and John. In fact, a touching scene back in chapter 3, right after he's healed, it says he clung to them. It's kind of like a gripping, sort of a, like a kid almost, like, these guys, man, they changed my life. It's like, he's like clinging on to them. But I want to point out something that's interesting. I don't know if you noticed this. This is the next day. Because Peter and John were thrown into jail and then released. And now this crippled, this crippled man who's now healed is back with them. Like, he's like, you know what? You're not losing me. And I love the picture that the, the application for us, like if your life's been touched by Jesus, where should you be found? Hanging next to godly people. Like standing next to godly people, man. I need what you have. Not, hey, um, having to beg people to be in life groups or having to run people down, try to get them connected. But it should be natural. I want to be with people that love God. I need to be around them. That's what this guy shows us. So this is undeniable to the leaders there. And then my favorite verse of all, verse 13, maybe in the whole Bible, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Love it. Look at these guys going, no fancy degrees, no fancy titles. They're super ordinary. Like, how are they doing what they're doing? The only thing we can tell is it looks like they've been with Jesus. I love that. May that be our credential, that we've been with Jesus. Boldness and courage, conviction, Change lives, helping lift people up, joy, gladness. You know, I was reflecting on this, and, uh, and it dawned on me that, that, and again, this is not in any kind of like an arrogant way, but that, but, but that we should be able to say to people in our lives who don't know the Lord, we should be able to say, you know, look, I, I know you don't believe, and maybe you never will, but you can't deny what Jesus has done in my life. Like I have so far to go and I'm so far from perfect, you know that, but you've seen the change in me at home. You've seen the change in me here at work. You've seen the change in how I spend money. You've seen the change in my life. Because I think it's okay to say stuff like that and give Jesus the glory. Because people can't, I, I hope, because there's too many Christians, you can't see any change if they're even Christians at all. To be able to say, you've seen the evidence of what Jesus has done in my life. You can't deny this. Changed lives are undeniable. Why fish? Because we can't help it. You can't deny it. And number three, you got to have it. It's that burning conviction in our hearts. And we can't save anybody, but we surely can witness with our life and with our words so that they can know that there's, there's a Savior. Verse 12 says this, chapter 4, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's no other way. I don't care what our culture says. Jesus is the only door into eternal life for the forgiveness of sin. 
There's no other religion or commands or system or guru. That's why 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So this is, this is um, gripping our hearts that we would ask ourselves the question, is there compassion we have for those without Jesus? You know, I, I, I wonder as we live our lives and maybe we go through maybe a bad week, we got a tough week, there have been trials in our lives, there have been some, maybe some physical struggles, and I don't mean to minimize any of those things. But, but the fact that we could be so beaten down by all that stuff, stuff at work or whatever, with the kids or whatever, and yet not be bothered at all that there's a workplace filled with unbelievers, not bothered at all. That there's a school filled with unbelievers, not doesn't bother us at all. Well, how could that be? That, that the eternal state of their soul, which remember, is even more crippled than someone laying there at the gate, needing the touch of Jesus. Oh, and let's not forget that if they go to Jesus, 100% cure rate. This isn't like they might get better. Jesus says, all who come upon me, I'll never cast out. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Paul says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. And not that we're all going to preach the same way, but, but in our relationships, it just simply means to let people know the good news. Are we gripped with this news that we can't help this, right? We can't help this. And the good news is that Jesus, he still has compassion on our crippled condition. He's still wanting to lift you up. Like maybe you're here and you still have not given your life to Jesus. He says, let me save you. Let me lift you up. Let me wipe out your sins and give you the times of refreshing. But you gotta get up. You gotta take that step, step out and believe. Turn from your sin and believe in Jesus and he'll lift you right up. And I believe some of you right now, you're doing that right now in your mind because that's, it's faith in your mind crying out to Jesus in your heart, save me. And guys, if you're here and you're a Christian, which most of you are, he just wants to use us to help people get up, to help lift people up. And so let's pray. Let's, let's go before the Lord and, and ask that, that, uh, that we would be filled with his spirit. Because remember Peter, before before he was filled with the Spirit, he was a coward. I mean, he denied Christ in front of a girl who had accused him. And now he's bold in front of all of these leaders who have the authority to take his head off. And he's, he's bold because of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your Spirit again. We ask that you, we would allow you to take total control of our lives. Lord, we, we pray that we would have that heart, and it's got to come from you, Lord. I know my heart can be hard. My heart can be so apathetic and selfish. Lord, ignite my heart again by the condition of people that don't know you. What we have to give to them is way better than gold. Sins wiped out, times of refreshing, literally dancing with you, Jesus. That's our prayer. That's our heart. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.